So it's December, overcast at 300 feet. The RVR is fluctuating between 500 meters and 900 meters. There's icing condition and tops are above 8,000 feet. We're stuck in the hangar waiting for better times. Since we're all here, let's speculate. Let's take an idealized look at pilot training and see if we can improve it, knowing well that the legal framework may not be present or that no one in the business is prepared for radical ideas. To begin, answer me this. What is the purpose of the skill test? For the sake of argument, let's agree that it is the following. The skill test is an official proof that the pilot is competent in the privileges granted, used by employers and insurance companies as a guarantee that their investment is secure, and by politicians to confide in that they are not liable to explain to the public why 200 people have died. In short, it validates the training courses that goes before the test, including the training organization, the teaching materials, and the trainers. Other essential effects of having a skill test at the end of a course may be that training organizations are motivated to maintain their training standard. Similarly, the skill test will also drive the students towards obtaining a standard since there is a consequence of not learning. So three essential and valid points. A recognition of a standard, motivation to uphold a standard, and motivation to achieve a standard. When we examine the content and the circumstances of the skill test, one could argue that the test is flawed. What exactly is demonstrated at a given skill test? Not necessarily the skills we expected to vouch for. Some very particular exercises that only partly represent what we need a pilot for. So what standards are the references? Well, we don't know since none are defined basically only tasks to be completed. Fair weather pilots may deviate significantly from the standards of probably trained salty pilots. Is the standard we reference then standardized? No. Examiners develop checking cultures locally as well as regionally, and applicants are free to select the one that suits their agenda. So is the skill test suitable towards the previously stated purpose? No, it does not deliver the guarantee we expect. Do accountability have a role in the existing concept? Yeah, accountability is the only validity we may put in the skill test concept since we can find the person that let substandard pass and hold him accountable for subsequent discoveries. Will this ever take place? Probably not. Whether or not you agree with the above bullets, we could probably agree that if we must have a check system, this is not the best one. Perhaps with reason, since the existing system is based on 1950s logic and technology, it is time for some change. So let's look into that. What is it we want flight training to deliver? Let's assume that we want flight training to deliver proficient pilots. Let's abandon the notion that training is the provider of proficiency for the following reasons. It divides into poor training and good training without pointing to what delivers quality of training other than resources allocated. It is not possible to define a single training standard that will guarantee a maximized outcome since the population we are applying it on is not uniform. If a training standard is fixed, in example given so many approaches, so many training hours, the standard will become stagnated, which is why we are stuck in the current system. And most importantly, training does not ensure learning. Instead of focusing on flight training, Let's focus on the learning process and call it flight learning to signify that emphasis. Many models for adult learning uses the William Edward Deming management cycle in a manner similar to this. Experience, experiment, 
reflection, modification, and then rinse and repeat. If we apply this to pilot learning, the model describes that the student has some experience, that the student has been shown what to achieve, ILS, figure eight turns, etc., that the student has been shown methods and tools required, and that the above constitutes the initial level of experience. The student is then allowed to experiment by flying the training flights for that particular purpose. The student will reflect on the experiment. The student will modify his or her own strategies. And the student will form a new level of experience. The cycle is repeated until sufficient level of proficiency is achieved on all required elements. The old linear lesson plan based training ensures that teaching is performed. But at its core, it pays no regard to whether or not learning is taking place. The training is complete when all the lessons are flown. And if this is insufficient, this is basically the problem of the student. Sure, most trainers uses grades. But this is normally to determine whether a student has passed each lesson element or not, an established ILS, a smooth landing, and so forth. It provides no guidance. So what's missing? Almost no emphasis is put on the activities that matter, the activities taking place outside the aircraft. We all understand why this is. Pilots run flight schools, and pilots want to fly, not teach. But why must regulation follow this logic? If we were to supply an alternative to flight training, let's use some of the newly introduced tool to aviation regulation, performance management. Performance management differs from the traditional approach in that training activities are based on actual training needs rather than a fixed program which is based on statistical training requirements. Actual training needs are determined on the basis of measuring performance of the training system several places along the process stream rather than only at the end of it. It is not based on student performance, but on how the system makes the student perform. If the system is weak, the student will perform accordingly. But there are weak students, I hear you say. No, there are only students not screened according to your system performance. If you take on all students, your system should cater for all types of students. So rather than having progress checks at the end of program phases and at the end of the course, a performance management pilot qualification program would measure if each lesson provides the yield it was expected. It would show if the student were actually learning. To determine if the student is learning, we must include other factors than merely recording how many feet the student exceeded the assigned altitude by. We must include the entire learning model rather than making pre-flight and in-flight be at the center. When using performance management processes, we must determine what we wish to achieve. We need to define what a student is required to do at the end of the training. I don't mean to fly an ILS to make smooth corrections, which we see as defined standards today. These are the tasks the pilot must be able to solve. They do not need to be taught. They're there for you and me to read. Instead, you need techniques to solve these tasks. And these techniques are the ones that must be determined as goals to achieve in the flight learning system. Example, if a student pilot is to fly an ILS, this involves the following techniques. How to achieve a given flight path by means of the attitude indicator. How to achieve a given airspeed by means of power selection. How to trim the aircraft. Standard operating procedures to configure the aircraft at appropriate positions prior to the approach. Standard operating procedures to set up for the approach in due time. How to summarize parameters from the approach plates to memory. How to determine 
rate of descent with relation to actual weather, how to determine wind correction angle with relations to actual weather, how weather is changing along the approach path, how instrument sensitivity is changing along the approach path, how much attention must be devoted to certain tasks during the approach, and so forth. The list is probably non-exhaustive, and none of these elements are new. However, if the student are proficient in these techniques, it becomes less relevant if the approach was flown established or not, and more relevant if the techniques were applied correctly. Wouldn't you agree? So these are the leading indicators to show downstream performance. Leading since we know that if the student performs poorly on these techniques, we know that he or she will perform poorly in the task outcome, which is then the downstream indicator. Until now, the techniques are largely defined by a great collective memory of the industry and a few non-exhaustive written bootleg SOPs in circulation. No official record of techniques to be mastered exists. But we need such a set of techniques to evaluate the student learning performance according to a common standard. In flight learning, we must monitor the entire learning cycle, especially the area of reflection and growth of experience. Nearly all flight lessons is initiated with a 60 minutes or more briefing, where the instructor is explaining what the student is expected to do. However, this is not supporting the way a person is learning. If the student have not prepared in advance how he or she intends to solve the task included in the flight, it will sure as shorts not help that the instructor asks that the learning cycle is sped up to be completed within the course of the pre-flight briefing. Instead, we should shift the focus from the flight segment to the post-flight briefing where the main task of the instructors is to ensure that the student will leave with the correct data to reflect on in order to continue the learning cycle in preparation for the next flight. If the student masters the ILS, should he or she then continue to train the ILS? No, of course not. If it has been learned, it can be forgotten, but it's not suddenly unlearned. So what's important now? In the current system, a student must have a basic theoretical knowledge that supports the elements of flight learning. Since the aircraft used for initial learning is very different from the aircraft used for a flying career, the students in the current system unfortunately must battle <laughs> with an additional amount of knowledge totally useless to solve the task presented in the qualification course and indistinguishable from the knowledge that is essential to solve the tasks presented in the qualification course. A student must also gather his or her own set of techniques used to solve the task to be solved, sometimes assisted to some degree by an SOP. The student must solve a series of tasks that is defined by what appears on the skill test. This does not support flight learning. Going back, assuming that we want qualification courses to deliver proficient pilots, we should then decide what pilot learning comprises of in order to apply performance management principles. What if we acknowledge that some theory is to be used now and some theory are to be used later? and then arranged for this distinction to be practicable. If the performance indicators are placed in flight learning, what is then the point of theoretical exams? What if we defined what techniques are required for a student in a given course rather than insisting on maneuver outcome? We could then tailor theoretical knowledge for this particular outcome. What if we refined or redefined what maneuvers are required for a given pilot qualification, correlating that to the techniques we define? 
And finally, what if we recognize that the training aircraft used are not suitable to prepare students for a career in aviation and provided intermediate courses based on the lower level simulations or updated aircrafts where a new set of competencies could be defined and associated techniques could be learned. We could also then tailor theoretical knowledge for this particular outcome. Looking to evidence-based training, which is implemented for commercial operators, recurrency training, we see that a whole new set of competencies is developed and that the tasks to be solved are defined in much more detail for given aircraft types. In this environment, it suddenly becomes clear how effective it can be to apply performance management concepts by documenting how the pilot performs in each defined parameter. And not only is it offering analysis in much more detail to be used for individual guidance at no additional costs, the amount of data also displays that the skill test is an inadequate and obsolete method to determine competency. The set of competencies defined for evidence-based training has a huge factual foundation, and though the set is not applicable to flight learning on the basic licenses, it displays some desirable characteristics in that the regulatory frame is not focused on the performance indicators, making the system agile towards future demands, and it can be implemented alongside old systems. It's clear that the reform of the flight training sector must be gradual. But can it not be done by supporting those that intend to put a higher degree of quality into their products? 